In December 1943, six months before the scheduled D-Day invasion, bombers of the U.S. 8th Air Force were losing the air war over Nazi Germany, taking alarming losses on missions outside the range of their fighter escorts. It was a crisis of unimaginable magnitude. Unless they achieved air supremacy over Northern Europe, the Allies had no chance of landing on the beaches of Normandy. But that very month, the long-range escort Allied leaders had been waiting for began arriving at American bomber bases in southeastern England. It was the P-51 Mustang, the miracle plane of World War II. The man who had fought hardest for its development was not an aviation engineer or an Air Force general, but an international polo star. Handsome, well-connected Tommy Hitchcock. In the summer of 1943, Lieutenant Colonel Hitchcock was serving as an American air attache in London. Every week, he read with horror reports of American bombers being decimated on deep penetration strikes into Nazi Germany. As many as 60 B-17 Flying Fortresses, the first American bombers to arrive in England, were slaughtered on a single raid. The fortress's heavy guns were no match for enemy fighters once the bombers crossed the German border. At that point, the Allied fighter escorts, their little friends, had to turn back because they lacked the range and fuel capacity to protect the forts all the way to their targets. Before the war, American aviation engineers considered it technologically impossible to develop a fighter plane that could go as fast and far as the bombers without losing their ability to defend themselves in aerial battles with the Luftwaffe, the most skilled pilots in the world flying the best fighter aircraft in the world. The Allies had to find an answer or the Nazis might prevail. In early 1942, months before American bombers began arriving in England, Tommy Hitchcock had begun a prolonged battle to provide Allied air leaders with the plane they needed to beat the Luftwaffe. Years earlier, in 1917, at the height of World War I, Hitchcock left St. Paul's, one of the finest private schools in the world, to join the famed Lafayette Flying Corps in France. He wanted to join the war. He was 17 years old. The Americans wouldn't take you in until you were 18, so Teddy Roosevelt was a great friend of my, my grandfather, so they arranged for Daddy to join the French aviation. Hitchcock loved flying and flew aggressively until March 1918, when he was shot down over Germany. Seriously wounded, he endured months as a prisoner of war before concocting a daring escape, leaping from a moving train and walking a hundred miles to neutral Switzerland. Following the war, Hitchcock enrolled at Harvard, then Oxford University, where he fell in with members of Britain's top families. Restless at school, he dropped out to play polo, becoming one of the finest players in the world leading four teams to U.S. Open Championships, representing the United States in the 1924 Paris Olympics, and becoming the inspiration for the polo-playing character Tom Buchanan in F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. He was, by all accounts, a natural leader. He was also fiercely competitive. I mean, that was very clear when he played polo. Very driven, very drawn to adventure, drawn to danger even. Hitchcock returned to Harvard to earn his degree before accepting a coveted partnership at Lehman Brothers investment firm. He applied himself with his usual energy and passion to have a successful career on Wall Street. He was one of the founders of American Export Lines. In his spare time, Hitchcock flew his seaplane, played tennis, and attended thoroughbred races with his father and the scions of American capitalism, the Belmonts, 
Vanderbilts, and Whitney's. My father knew everybody you know, all over the world. I mean, you know, you could get to anybody. He would soon need these connections. When the United States entered World War II, Hitchcock had one desire, to become a fighter pilot. Too old for combat duty, he accepted a post as assistant air attaché to the U.S. Embassy in London, where his old prep school teacher from St. Paul's, Gil Wynant Sr., served as ambassador to Great Britain. In the spring of 1942, Hitchcock visited a fighter airfield in Duxford, England. The British were testing an early version of the P-51 Mustang, an American fighter plane built for the Royal Air Force. The P-51 was faster and had longer range than the current workhorses of the RAF, the Spitfires and Hurricanes. But its underpowered Allison engine made it unsuitable for high altitude flying. The British instead used the P-51 as a low-level tactical fighter, providing cover for tanks and ground troops in North Africa. Impressed by its performance and streamlined airframe, Hitchcock made the bold recommendation to Washington that the Mustang be made into a high-altitude fighter by crossbreeding it with the British Merlin 61 engine produced by Rolls-Royce. Meanwhile, Hitchcock moved ahead in Britain to test the modification and transform the P-51 into a sensational high-altitude aircraft, a small, streamlined beauty that was faster, lighter, and more nimble than anything in the Nazi arsenal. Hitchcock and Wynant excitedly cabled the news back to Washington. But there was no great interest in the plane. And the reason for that is because it was British. Even though it was an American plane, it had, was built by an American company, it was designed for British use. But even worse was the fact that they were going to use a British engine. There was another reason. Early in the war, General Hap Arnold, head of the American Army Air Forces, believed that his state-of-the-art bombers flying in tight combat boxes could muscle their way to enemy industrial sites without the aid of long-range escorts. Undaunted, Hitchcock pressed on, meeting with an old friend with clout. He just so happened to be a very close friend of the Under Secretary of War, Robert Lovett. They had known each other since they were young pilots uh, in World War I. Lovett immediately recognized the P-51 Mustang as a superior machine and placed an initial order for 2,200 planes in 1942. Not nearly enough, but it was a start. Still, the Army Air Forces dragged its feet. The plane wasn't a priority. Losses over Germany had not yet become catastrophic. Hitchcock persisted. Hitchcock ramrodded it through. He was visiting the factories where they were being made. He was putting pressure on people in Washington to speed up the mass production of these planes. In a letter home to his wife Peggy, Tommy Hitchcock summed up his efforts with characteristic modesty, writing, in some way, I am doing some good. Hitchcock's work finally paid off after the Regensburg Schweinfurt raid of August 17, 1943. In the largest American bombing mission of the war up to that point, the 8th Air Force lost 60 fortresses and 600 flyers. Suddenly, Arnold was deeply interested in the Mustang and ordered the plane in great numbers. In the early winter of 1944, the Mustang, equipped with extra fuel tanks on its wings, began escorting bombers on long-range missions all the way to Berlin. Results were immediate and devastating for the Luftwaffe. In March alone, American fighters, including Mustangs, along with Thunderbolts and Lightnings modified for greater range, shot down twice as many German planes as they had over the previous two years. The Mustang, however, exhibited a weakness. 
it struggled to pull out of steep dives. Eager to solve the problem, Hitchcock insisted on testing the plane himself. On April 18, 1944, his Mustang failed to pull out of a dive and crashed in Salisbury, England, killing Hitchcock. One month later, with the dive issue fixed, the Allies achieved the air supremacy considered indispensable for the invasion of Hitler's Fortress Europe. The P-51 Mustang, Tommy Hitchcock's dream, was a war-winning plane.